I'm Mike Vicar. I'm the bureau chief here in Washington, D.C., which is in the east, uh, uh, watching this vote again for the second day in a row in the House of Representatives. And breaking news as we come on the air, uh, Kevin McCarthy has gone down to defeat for a fourth time. Uh, this is the first vote in the House today after he lost three times yesterday. Uh, the vote today of 212 for Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic candidate uh, to be the Speaker of the House. Kevin McCarthy gathering uh, just 201 votes. Uh, and Byron Donalds, who's a new face uh, in Congress and at least a new nominee for Speaker, put forth by some of the MAGA, the, the MAGA conservative Republicans who are leading this uh, rebellion within the Democratic Party. He was put forth. He got 20 votes. Uh, just so everybody understands, it takes 218, a majority of the House of Representatives, uh, to win the speakership. Uh, and for the fourth time in a row, breaking news now, uh, Kevin McCarthy has fallen short. Where do we go from here? I do not know. I've covered the House. I had a desk just outside the House chamber for 11 years uh, working for another network. I thought I'd seen it all. I have never seen this. I've been there a long time. I was not there, however, 100 years ago in 1923, the last time it took multiple ballots uh, for a speaker to be elected. And let me start by saying, why, you know, why is this important? Why do you care uh, about these intramural squabbles in the House of Representatives? Uh, because the House of Representatives cannot convene. Nobody is sworn in. Nobody can organize. There are no committees. They can't hire staff. The work of the nation, to the extent that the House is doing the work of the nation, and really, uh, essentially, they are, uh, at least keeping the government fun functioning and debating uh, the issues of the day, uh, none of that is happening uh, until a speaker is sworn in. None of the 434 current members of the House can be sworn in until there is a speaker, until 218 members of the, those 434 can agree on who they want to set forth as speaker. So a lot of questions out there right now. And uh, the, the first one is, you know, why can't they come up with a compromise? Why can't they come up with somebody who's sort of middle of the road that enough Democrats and Republicans could get together and agree on? And I guess the short answer for that is, uh, again, having covered the House for a long time, that's just not the way the House works. The House is a fiercely partisan, uh, what they call a majoritarian institution. The majority always rules. And that didn't start 10 years ago. That didn't start 30 years ago with Newt Gingrich. That didn't start with Sam Rayburn in the 50s. That started in the 18th century with Henry Clay in, in the late, uh, I'm sorry, the 19th century. You know, 130 years ago, there was a speaker named Thomas Brackett Reed, a Republican, who said the job of the majority is to collect it, sit down, shut up and cash its paychecks. And that's basically the way the House works. Many of these members would just as soon dash their eyes out with hot pokers than vote for a member of the opposite party for Speaker of the House. It's sort of, this isn't schoolhouse rock, or as Punchbowl put it this morning, it's not the West Wing. It's just simply not the way the House works. I mean, we're in uncharted territory. Who knows how this is going to work? Uh, but Democrats are in sitting back and enjoying this show. Not one Democrat in these four votes has voted for somebody other than Hakeem Jeffries from Brooklyn, New York, a, a Democratic member of the House, for Speaker. Um, they, you know, the, the old adage in politics, especially in the national legislature here in Congress, is if your enemy is having a hanging party, then you just give enough rope and stand back and watch them do it. Or another metaphor, a circular firing squad, don't interfere. Uh, the, the perception is, is that this is a... Um, you know, uh, I can't say the word, but a bad show <laughs> for Republicans, at least on the part of Democrats. And certainly the consensus appears to be both in the Weisbrand media, within the Republican Party, uh, within the establishment, uh, however you want to phrase it, that this is not a good look for Republicans. So Democrats have absolutely no political incentive to come to their rescue at this point. The people who are objecting to Kevin McCarthy, who are voting against Kevin McCarthy, show absolutely no sign of backing down. And so that's why we have this spectacle of the House and Kevin McCarthy in particular and his backers sort of pounding their head against the wall repeatedly. Um, you know, this Sisyphean struggle, they're pushing the rock up the hill, they almost get there and then it falls to the bottom and they start over again. Uh, that's why you're seeing what you're seeing now. So, yeah, there's talk about a compromise candidate. Uh, a name that's frequently mentioned is Fred Upton. He's from Western Michigan. He was in the House for a long time. He just retired 
probably because he couldn't get reelected in the current environment. He would have been challenged from the right. Uh, so he is retired. Um, he, you know, he once had a powerful position in the old days when, in, you know, uh, he was the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Why can't they choose somebody like that? He's a Republican after all. Um, and the answer I think I've already answered is it's highly unlikely that Democrats would go for them. It's just not the way it works. I mean, the, uh, the House, again, is by nature partisan. The Office of the Whip, many of you have probably heard of what a whip is. They're in charge of enforcing party dis discipline. That wasn't invented with Tom DeLay in the 90s and, and the aughts. I mean, that's been in, pl in place since the time Congress was created. Uh, and th that in itself was derived from Parliament in, in earlier centuries. So the, this is the way a, the House of Commons, this is the way the House of Representatives here in the United States often works. You know, I, again, I covered the place for 11 years. I understand the thinking that, you know, why can't they just compromise? Because in the popular imagination, you know, it's all about compromise. That might be true in the Senate, where it takes 60 votes to get anything done, although it's it's become less common in the Senate partisanship uh, than it was in the good old days. Uh, but it's it's never been true in the House. And I started covering the House on a daily basis in 1997. And I'm just like the rest of you. I was shocked at how little actual agreement there is. It's you're with us, you're against us. You're a good guy, you're a bad guy. Or in, in the modern vernacular, you're on the red team or you're on the blue team. Uh, and that's the way uh, that's the way the House of Representatives works. So how does all this translate? What is the solution? What is the way out? You see they're huddling many of the conservative members uh, who have rebelled, the rebellious um, breakaway group there. You see Matt Gates of the F Florida's Panhandle, Florida uh, First District, standing there in the middle of them. Uh, he has been one of the main agitators, openly defying um, Kevin McCarthy. Even today, writing to the architect of the Capitol, uh, to asking Kevin McCarthy to be thrown out of what's traditionally the Speaker's offices. For some reason, Kevin McCarthy moved across uh, Statuary Hall in the Capitol into the, the Speaker's offices, previously inhabited and recently vacated by Nancy Pelosi, before he became Speaker. And Matt Gates says, Kevin McCarthy, get out. He wants the architect of the Capitol to evict him. That's not likely to happen. The architect of the Capitol doesn't go uh, do that sort of thing. And so, you know, what do we have here? Uh, a lot of people say it's an embarrassment. A lot of people say it's the destruction of democracy. Um, I, frankly, I am an institutionalist that stands behind no one in my respect for the institution, if not for the individual components and members that make it up. And, you know, I would say that it's almost, you know, you've heard the argument, particularly coming from Republicans, both those nominating Kevin McCarthy and, and Chip Roy, the perhaps the leader of this rump group of breakaway MAGA Republicans, saying this is democracy in action. You know what? After so many years of watching the House of Representatives and so many years of seeing everything pre-baked and whatever put on the floor as a fait accompli, mm -hmm. um, to see these issues being discussed in the open, uh, to see um, a rebellion uh, take place on the House floor, a, a democratic rebellion. You know, I, I'm frankly, I don't see this as an apocalyptic moment in American democracy. I might even see it as the opposite, uh, if in fact this is ever, ever resolved. So uh, we do have a question here from uh, one of you. It says, what's next? Is there a limit on the amount of times they can vote? No, there is no limit. And incidentally, if you do have questions, please do go ahead and ask. I love talking about this kind of stuff. Um, there is no limit. Um, I think many of you are aware that in, in when it last happened, when it didn't happen, when the a speaker was not elected in the first ballot, that was in 1923 after the 1922 elections. Uh, I believe it took seven votes, seven ballots at that point. Uh, and in the end, the uh, the equivalent of Kevin McCarthy, I think his name was Frederick Gillette, was in fact elected. Uh, the Speaker of the House. Um, the last time it happened before 1923 was prior to the Civil War and in the very um, uh, difficult time and difficult time and divisive time in American politics, obviously, that led to the Civil War in the, in the decades pr previous to that of the issue of slavery. You know, there were more than 100 ballots uh, sometimes. So, you know, we think we have dysfunction now. Uh, the House in its history has experienced uh, a lot more, a lot more dysfunction, particularly you know, leading up to what is obviously the most dysfunctional time of all, and I only mean that 
half facetiously, uh, and that was the civil war and open warfare. So, um, you know, democracy marches on. Nobody is claiming, look at the bright side. No one's claiming the vote's been rigged. Everybody is standing up in the House of Representatives. And then we have Representative Perry, you see in the middle holding court. Uh, I believe he's in the middle aisle, which is kind of strange because there are Democrats to the left of frame here and Republicans to the right of frame, including Matt Gates now leaning over and talking to what looks like a Democrat on the Democratic side of the aisle. You've seen a lot of strange things. You know, a lot of people were commenting yesterday. They saw Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez talking with Matt Gates, uh, ideological opposites, um, and thought perhaps that was a sign that they were going to come together on a compromise candidate. Um, again, I kind of doubt it. Uh, I think it was probably AOC uh, telling Matt Gates that, you know what, we're not going anywhere. We're not budging. So you guys just keep carrying on and doing your thing as long as you think it's necessary. Again, what is the incentive for Democrats to, to, to come off of Hakeem Jeffries and vote for somebody else? There's absolutely no incentive whatsoever. When you're the minority in the House of Representatives, whether it's Republican Party or Democratic Party, you are you have virtually no say in legislation that hits the floor. It's just the way it's constructed. The leadership exerts their will through something called the Real Rules Committee. Everything that comes on the floor of the House goes through this committee and the, the debate rules are set up to make it virtually impossible to assure that the majority always gets its way. That's the way the House of Representatives works. Uh, Kim from Facebook asks, uh, what would have to happen for Dems to get the seat? Gosh, you know what, I, Kim, I keep asking myself this question too. What would happen? What would it even look like? Um, let's say that a group of, let's see, Jeffries is getting 212. He needs 218. So what, what, what would a group of six true rebel, moderate, I would say almost sui politically suicidal Republicans who would, what happens if they would decide to vote for Hakeem Jeffries with all the Democrats and Jeffries got the 218 to become speaker? I think it's extremely unlikely. I think that we would have to go through this for an unimaginable amount of time until there was a true, not just political crisis here in Washington, but a crisis that demanded that that, that the American people have their representatives actually functioning uh, here in Congress. Um, what would that look like? Who would be the chairman of the committees if there were a Democratic speaker, but a Republican majority? Um, again, the Speaker of the House has so much power, and that's part of what these re rebellious MAGA Republicans are so angry about. They don't want the Speaker to have that much power. They want to be able to vote to replace the Speaker with just five members uh, forcing a vote in the full House of Representatives on that. They want the Speaker not to have so much say on who gets to be on what committees and reward allies and punish enemies within their own conference by putting them on so-called B-list committees and putting their allies on A-list committees. I mean, look at Jim Jordan, uh, the controversial conservative from Ohio, uh, who's backing Kevin McCarthy. He's going to be chairman of the Judiciary Committee. That's a big deal, especially when you consider all the th investigations that uh, Republicans have vowed to pursue against the Biden administration, the president's son, Hunter Biden, uh, the origins of COVID, Anthony Ka uh, Fauci, uh, the, um, what they call the overreach, or I can't remember the exact term, but um, the weaponization is what it was of uh, the FBI and other federal agencies. All that's going to go through Jim Jordan. He is going to be huge uh, in the public eye, and that is an incentive um, for any politician. And regardless of how altruistic they are. And so while we wait for the official tally uh, to be announced by uh, the House reading clerk, um, you know, we are in limbo. We are in uncharted territory. Again, I consider myself to be an institutionalist. I consider myself to understand the way the House works. I don't know where this goes from here. Um, from a journalistic view uh, standpoint, this is a heck of a story because nobody knows. It's not baked in. We don't know what the heck's going to happen. Um, you know, from, uh, you know, for the average citizen, I know it's kind of bewildering why this has to happen. Um, and after a while, I'm sure it's going to get tiresome. And I think once uh, that could be something that breaks the logjam here, once people start to turn away or express their disgust with this, um, that could break things one way or the other, because after all, they do represent uh, the American people. And if their constituents are angry, uh, then that is that I think the good news is is that uh, members of Congress are still sensitive uh, to how their constituents feel. Ruth from YouTube, why won't McCarthy give up? Huh. 
I think that he thinks, you know, since nobody knows how this is going to end up, it's just as plausible a resolution that Kevin McCarthy is elected speaker at the end of this. I think that, you know, of all the possible resolutions and they're, they're virtually infinite, that still is probably the most likely, although I'd still, I'd say it's less than 50% chance that it happens, certainly. Kevin McCarthy has said that he, you know, he said yesterday, I've had the longest speech on record on the House floor, quite a distinction. Uh, so I can sit there as long as and have as many votes as possible and sit there as, for as long as this takes until uh, I'm elected speaker. OK, he's also said that who else is there within the Republican conference? The, the Re Republicans call themselves a conference. The Democrats call themselves a caucus. He said that who else is there that could get 218 votes, Republican, 218 Republican votes? Who else is there? And he might be right. Um, there is nobody else that's apparent right now. You know, I, I would say the default candidate, if you had to choose one, would be uh, the second in command, who's in line to be the majority leader, Steve Scalise of, of uh, Louisiana. Um, but Scalise, first of all, has been loyal throughout the last several weeks and days and hours uh, to Kevin McCarthy, even stood up and nominated Kevin McCarthy. And I think it was the third, second or third vote yesterday. Um, so, you know, that's why he's holding on, you know, these guys, politics is bred in the bone for these guys. Um, you know, th they are politicians at heart. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And as long as there's a sliver of a chance, they're going to stand for election. When you see people who give up at the end of the day, that's because they see the writing on the wall. The writing is not yet on the wall that Kevin McCarthy can't win. Odds are diminishing by the minute, but it's not, a, it's not a foregone conclusion that Kevin McCarthy is going to lose this race in the end. And I think that's why he's sticking around. Uh, okay, I'm getting a wrap from my friend Alex, the producer. Alex, you're doing a heck of a job. So um, that's everything I know about the House of Representatives. That's everything I know about what, what you're seeing, the spectacle you're seeing playing out. You know, it. Uh, people think it's in... Uh, an S show, um, I tend to think that it could be sort of a, a cleansing experience for American democracy so people can actually see the way the House actually works and vote accordingly when, we have, when we're called upon to do that in the next elections in 2024. But maybe I'm just uh, a starry-eyed dreamer about the, the future of American democracy. Um, in any event, um, uh, we will go on to a fifth vote. What happens today? I don't know. One other thing, Alex, um, just to get into the weeds a little bit, uh, they could try to adjourn. Could Kevin McCarthy and other Republicans, they could try to adjourn. Democrats would have to um, Democrats would have to go along with that. Why would they? This is this is uh, this is a circ circular firing squad. And so Democrats would like to see them continue to dangle to mix metaphors, I guess. Uh, so I don't know what, what's going to happen from here. It's a heck of a thing. We have a front row seat uh, and it could go on for the next day, certainly. Um, and there's already talk that could go into the weekend. So that's it for me. I'm Mike Vicara. It's reporting here from News Nation, the bureau chief here in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned.